Okay, thank you, Uday. So good evening, everyone. So welcome to the uh, session on the uh, cleaning and contamination control strategy uh, conference. So this is the uh, part two of the uh, series. So in today's uh, conference, uh, there will be uh, three main topics. So the first topic will be on the uh, preventive maintenance on stainless steel system. So for this topic, uh, Paul Lopolito and myself will present on this topic. And then uh, this will be followed by the uh, second topic, which is on a risk-based contamination control strategy. And this will be presented by Jim Porodin. And the last topic for today will be on surface decontamination with VHP, uh, fundamentals and facility integrations. So this topic will be presented by Nicholas Tan and uh, Bruno. So each topic will be 45 minutes and uh, including the uh, 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can uh, write your questions in the uh, chat box and we will try our best to answer uh, most of the questions within the time limit. Okay, next slide, Paul. Okay, so the first topic will be on the uh, preventive maintenance on stainless steel system. So before I begin, I would like to uh, introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Paul Lopolito. So uh, Paul Lopolito is a senior technical services manager for the life sciences division of Steris Corporation, uh, based in Mentor, Ohio. So he currently provides global technical support related to process cleaning, cleaning validation and contamination control, which includes field support, site audits, training presentations and educational seminars. So Paul has uh, over 20 years of industry experience and has held positions as a technical services manager, manufacturing manager, and laboratory manager. So Paul is a frequent speaker at industry events and has published several articles and book chapters related to cleaning validation, uh, stainless steel maintenance, and contamination control. So uh, without further ado, um, I will start my presentation first, and then uh, Paul will take over uh, along with me. So for today's uh, uh, first session, so we will look at overview of stainless steel, uh, get a basic understanding of what is uh, actually stainless steel, and then also look at the uh, some of the causes and concerns for the rouge, which is the corrosion on the stainless steel surfaces. And then followed by regulatory position. So what is the uh, regulatory position on the uh, rouge or corrosion on those uh, surfaces? And then we also look at the risk-based strategy to stainless steel maintenance. And then also look at the case studies, the use of the protective models, um, basically to uh, maintain the stainless steel surface in the presence of the corrosive products. And lastly, we will look at uh, what are the added benefits from the uh, acid use on the equipment surfaces. So this will be the few uh, uh, important elements important points that we will discuss about in today's uh, presentation. Next slide. Paul, oh, next slide. Sorry, I think uh, Paul seemed to uh, freeze. <laughs> uh, the slide can't move. Yeah, I think he has frozen. Yeah. So, do you have the presentation, uh, Richard? I can make uh, it. Yes, a I have. Yeah, I think. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll make you the um, presenter. Okay. Uh, okay. The control of the screen is with you now. You can just share your screen. Show my screen. Yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, no, not yet. Well, uh, yeah, now I can see, yes. Can see, yeah, okay, let me see. Oops. Um, yeah, I can see your screen okay. now. Let me get full screen first. Yes. So is it full it is screen now? Full. Okay. Yes, it is full screen. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so sorry, we, uh, our yeah. apologies for this disruption. 
Yeah, you can go ahead, Richard. Okay, so first we look at the uh, basics of the stainless steel. So basically, stainless steel has. Let me see. Oops, I clicked wrong way out. Sorry about that. Um, it's my screen. Okay. Okay, the uh, there are different types and uh, grades of stainless steel. Um, so uh, commonly used type in the um, pharmaceutical manufacturing is basically the 304 and 316 grade of stainless steel. So the difference between 304 and 316 grade is basically the presence of the uh, molybdenum in 316 grade of stainless steel. So this molybdenum has the uh, effect of improve the uh, corrosion resistance uh, for the stainless steel. And uh, if you look at the uh, 316 and 316L, so the difference between 316 and 316L is the uh, lower carbon content for the uh, 316L. So the uh, lower carbon content will have the effect of uh, better corrosion resistance because during the uh, welding, if the carbon content is higher, you will tend to have the uh, chromium carbide uh, formation, which can cause corrosion compared to the uh, a lower carbon content in the 316L. So typically for product contact surfaces, 316L grid of stainless steel is typically used. Uh, for 304, it's typically used for the uh, non-product contact surfaces, such as the um, cleaning furniture, the shelf, the chairs, yeah, and things like that. So if you look at the picture here, um, so the uh, reason why stainless steel is uh, corrosion resistance it is mainly because of the presence of a thin layer of passive layer. Uh, so this passive layer is basically a chromium oxide layer. Uh, so it is this layer which protects the uh, stainless steel from corrosion. So this passive layer is very thin. It's between a uh, three to five nanometer thick. So it's very thin layer, and uh, if this layer is damaged or depleted over time, um, corrosion will set in. So we will talk a little bit more about this uh, uh, in the next few slides. So let's look at the nature of rouge. So basically, rouge is a corrosion product on stainless steel composed of mainly various forms of iron oxide. So basically, the uh, rouge is a formation of iron oxide uh, can be iron oxide iron three oxide or iron four oxide so the because of the iron oxide you can see the color which is typically brownish color or sometimes reddish brown color the different shades of the iron oxides so typically can occur in water system as well as the process equipment water system is because sometimes the uh, especially the uh, water for injection system high temperature, high purity water. So those are considered as corrosive environment. So in those uh, corrosive environment, uh, roots can occur. And uh, some of the roots can wipe off easily. So others are tenacious and can be reddish brown to black. So we will talk about the different types of the roots later on. So what are the causes and the concerns of roots? So for roots, um, the causes is basically high, highly corrosive environment. So especially when you have a steam line, I mean steam, or you perform SIPs. So steam can be considered as a corrosive element. Uh, sometimes after you use the autoclave or for the equipment which you have a steam in place, uh, sometimes you can see the uh, surfaces in those equipment can turn a reddish brown color after a while. So those are signs of corrosion on the surface and also if you have the uh, buffers corrosive buffers or corrosive products that contains the uh, halides or chlorides uh, so this can attack the uh, passive layer as well and cause corrosion uh, high temperature and stress and erosion yeah as i mentioned before the high temperature especially in the uh, water system where you have the high temperature and the steam line as well high temperature so those are considered as corrosive environment the other reason is uh, improper surface condition. For example, the welding not done properly, uh, those can be considered as a weak point. Uh, so this weak point can be a point whereby the corrosion can start to occur. 
and the surface defects when you have scratches on the surface uh, this can cause the passive layer to be damaged so once that happens you can see the root or rust occurs on those uh, specific uh, areas inadequate cleaning if your cleaning is not uh, robust uh, you have uh, residues product residues left behind on the equipment surfaces so those can cause corrosion as well uh, and also inadequate passivation so typically you will need to uh, perform some kind of maintenance uh, to uh, passive it to, to, uh, once a year or once in six months basically for uh, to maintain the uh, passive layer so if you do not have any uh, preventive maintenance on a periodic basis um, the passive layer can be depleted or damaged and um, uh, if there's no maintenance in place uh, corrosion can set in so typically it's very important to have some kind of periodic maintenance on those equipment surfaces so what are the concerns of roots so once roots occurs on the surface so the effect is the increase in the surface roughness so once there is a, there is an increase in the surface roughness uh, it will reduce the cleanability of the surface that means your normal cleaning procedures will not be effective to remove the residues uh, from the surface as the uh, increase in the surface roughness can trap the microbial residues as well as the product residues and this can cause basically microbial excursions or the product contamination in your products so those are the uh, quite a serious consequences and at the same time it can also reduce the equipment life because once corrosion sets in um, it can uh, deteriorate over time if uh, no remediation is done to remediate those uh, uh, roots on the surface so next we look at the types of roots so type one roots is basically very easy to remove from the surface so typically this is um, i mean the uh, corrosion occurs somewhere upstream of the system and then the roots carry downstream and deposited on the area so this kind of root is very easy to remove once you wipe it you can uh, remove it easily type 2 root is basically the roots uh, form in situ oxidation of stainless steel that means there is a underlying corrosion on the area so these are typically tightly adhered and uh, typically have the uh, damage or corrosion on the surfaces so this can be remediated by uh, the chemical means perform the uh, derouging and preservation so type 3 root is basically the black oxide root generated from high temperature or steam line especially in the steam line uh, become a black oxide root so this is uh, typically non-reactive you wipe it you can remove some part of it but the underlying uh, layer is still uh, uh, grayish or black color so this kind of roots typically cannot be uh, remediated fully by using chemical means you, know, you may need to uh, perform the mechanical polish or electro polish to remediate the type 3 roots so these are the type of corrosion uh, pitting corrosion so pitting corrosion is basically you can see that on the surface is uh, small pits small holes uh, so these are basically caused by the uh, corrosive products such as the uh, chlorides that attacks the surface and causing the small pits and holes on the surface so once you have this you will need to have mechanical or electro polish to remediate this kind of uh, corrosion of course uh, you can have a previous corrosion as well if you have a boat and a nut sometimes uh, the uh, layers between the uh, boat and the nut on the surface uh, because this is uh, shielded from the environmental uh, the, the oxygen so and also the um, residues contaminant can trap in between the layers so over time this layer not exposed to the environment or the oxygen they cannot regenerate the uh, passive layer and also because of the residues all this can cause the corrosion in between in between the layers and that one is basically the surface corrosion so this is basically the uh, passive layer damage uh, due to corrosive environment uh, you can see the underlying damage on the surface so these are the three main types of corrosion that you can see uh, in the uh, process or the, the utility equipment 
So basically, the uh, deroging. So when you perform deroging, so what is the uh, uh, principle involved? So typically, deroging is to dissolve the iron oxide uh, uh, from the surface. So iron oxide is basically the root, and uh, if uh, for dissolving the uh, iron oxide, typically you will need to uh, use the acidic uh, detergent. So in this case, uh, this is a diagram to show uh, what kind of detergent is effective in the removal of the iron oxide from the surface. So if you have the alkaline detergent, so it will not be effective. So this is basically the solubility of the iron in this solution. So if you have the phosphoric citric acid detergent, so you can see that it is, I mean, the iron oxide is very soluble in this phosphoric and citric acid detergent. So this shows that this will be very effective in the removal of the roots from the surface. And also uh, not the effective is basically the glycolate or the neutral detergent. So dilution and precipitation, this is the uh, simple diagram to show the principle. So in a normal standard steel, you can see that there's a, a passive layer, chromium oxide layer, which is protecting the standard steel uh, surfaces. So over time, this passive layer can be depleted or damaged. So when this layer is damaged, the uh, iron content, the iron in the stainless steel can react with the oxygen to form iron oxide. So this will appear as the rich reddish brown color. So to remediate it, typically uh, you will need to clean the surface using alkaline detergent first before we proceed to use the acidic detergent to uh, dissolve the iron oxide from the uh, surface. So once the iron oxide is dissolved or removed from the damaged surface, uh, the chromium basically will react with the oxygen to form the chromium oxide, which is the passive layer again. So this is to uh, uh, passivate the surface. So basically this shows the uh, overall process of deroging and also passivation. So this is the micropitting. So micropitting is basically the uh, uh, caused by the uh, electrochemical oxidation reduction process, which can occur in the absence of the passive layer. So you, if you have the corrosive products chlorides, there is an oxidation reduction process, which can uh, basically cause the pits to be formed on the surface. Typically, these are the localized uh, pitting on the surface. So we'll, next, we look at the regulations. So this is one of the regulations that um, is related to the root. So if you look at the 21 CFR part 211, uh, 65 uh, equipment construction. So here there says that um, equipment shall be constructed so that surfaces that contact components in process materials or drug products shall not be reactive, uh, additive or absorptive. So if you have a root surface uh, that can be uh, uh, reactive, and also additive as well, in the sense that it can uh, uh, release some particles into the system. And absorptive as well, I mean, uh, basically, it can trap the residues uh, on to the surfaces. So typically, this is what it means. So basically, luge is typically um, um, uh, not, basically, uh, not uh, in compliance with these uh, uh, regulations from 21 CFR. So next, we look at the uh, two warning letters quickly. Uh, so uh, in this case, the first one is ISO 5 hood as an area of rust observed on the surface. And in the uh, second case is basically, uh, there are some rust observed as well on the equipment surfaces. So typically, it is very important to remove uh, any rust from equipment surfaces. So even, the, uh, even on the non-product contact surfaces as well, because one of the inspectors noticed that you have rust on even the uh, non-product contact surfaces. You may want to look at how you maintain the uh, product contact surfaces uh, and minimize the formation of roots in those areas. So um, it's very important to basically uh, maintain the sinusoid surfaces to minimize the formation of roots and the rust. So next, uh, yeah. My colleague Paul will take over from here. Um, Thank you, Richard. Paul, um, what are you? Yeah. 
hopefully everybody can hear me. I had a little bit of a disconnection early on, uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about a system-based or a risk-based strategy to stainless steel maintenance. Uh, and it really kind of takes into account three different approaches, either a, a routine use as shown with the arrow on the right, uh, which would be for um, uh, for areas that are, um, it would be the lowest risk uh, from your process perspective. Um, second would be more of a preventive uh, maintenance approach. Uh, and the third is a corrective action approach. And obviously, as you move into corrective action approach, um, and you want to, perfect. And you, and the corrective action is things that you want to avoid. It leads to high risk. Um, we want to think about this uh, from a risk-based approach in terms of, of reviewing assessment and control of the, of the actual um, applications. And then we're going to divide it into four areas represented by the triangle. Uh, the first is no direct contact, so it'll be a low risk application. Uh, it's generally when uh, it's observed, then you go ahead and react to, to eliminate it. Uh, the second it, uh, tier would be utility systems in indirect contact surfaces, and we're going to provide a lot of detail in regards to these two applications. And the top of the pyramid here is direct contact. And obviously, this is where it's under uh, the highest risk. So now we want to go over to the next slide, Richard. Uh, so let's now talk about utility systems. And utility systems would be, uh, previous slide, Richard. Uh, the utility systems would be water, uh, clean steam, uh, and um, uh, cooling, it could be even cooling systems or compressed gases. Uh, the, the image on your uh, top left is is actually a clean steam uh, at line, and you can see that black um, oxide, that type 3 rouge that Richard talked about, and then a water system application underneath that, and you have more of that type 1 uh, type uh, rouge in which you can wipe off and see bright, shiny metallic finish underneath. In most cases, we're going to be looking at a preventive approach for utility systems applications. Uh, so next slide, Richard. Uh, so a preventive approach would be a periodic uh, treatment with uh, an acid-based detergent, um, and that's generally uh, with a high concentration. Uh, so in this example here, we have a water storage tank. Um, and this is done uh, on an annual basis with a 15 to 20 percent concentration of uh, phosphoric citric acid based detergent, uh, exposure time for several hours at temperatures to 70 to 80 degrees, um, and this would be done on an annual basis. So there would be some level of rouge in the system over the course of that year, and then there's the treatment. Next slide. Now, for utility systems, especially water systems, we're also seeing that uh, companies are looking at a predictive approach in which they, they build data um, to extend the time between the maintenance events. And they set markers to trigger that main events. And we see tools such as monitoring iron levels, uh, monitoring non-viable or viable particulate levels, monitoring conductivity, uh, or monitoring TOC levels, and at some trigger, um, incorporate uh, the maintenance event. I have not seen um, a lot of publications around this, but I know a lot of companies are looking at uh, developing predictive models around water systems. And again, a lot of that is to extend that frequency time, that time between the maintenance events. Uh, because obviously that is downtime of the system. Okay, next slide. Uh, the next area would be indirect contact. Uh, so this would be buffer tanks, steam sterilizers, CIP skids, uh, lyophilizers, vial washers, parts washers. Um, here we're looking at either routine 
um, use of acids to maintain the surface, especially with buffered tanks and lyophilizers. Um, but we also see sometimes preventive maintenance approaches. So at some frequency, they're using an acid to um, remediate rouge, maintain the stainless steel. Next slide, please. Um, here's, a, here's an example for that. Um, this is a buffer storage tank uh, in the top uh, right, and then the bottom is a, is a steam sterilizer. So at some frequency, uh, normally either semi-annual or annual, um, you would go in and do a pre-cleaning with an alkaline detergent, uh, typically within the use concentration of that alkaline detergent, uh, you know, one to five percent, uh, generally a high temperature, 60 to 80 degrees, and generally for uh, a moderate time, normally 30 to 60 minutes. And then they would perform a rouge removal step similar to the water system, high concentrations, uh, oftentimes 15 to 30 percent concentration at 60 to 80 degrees and oftentimes several hours. Uh, and in some cases for things like autoclaves, parts washers, lyophilizers, sometimes that is a manual cleaning event um, at, to remediate it. Okay, next slide. Now we've also seen uh, companies um, using uh, foaming acid detergents. So this is the conveyor belts. Uh, we see some rouge, uh, some corrosion on your image to your left. And then we have a uh, treatment with a foaming type acid product, uh, and then either a non-abrasive scrub or, or wipe and then rinse it off. Uh, and again, this is generally done on a periodic basis to maintain that surface. Um, okay, next slide. Now we've also seen companies uh, look to more of a kind of a predictive type modeling. So in this case, we have a sample buffer that's 50% sucrose, 200 millimolar tris, 100 millimolar EDTA, pH 7.5, um, and it's actually prepared and then baked um, uh, or, or sterilized and then, and then going ahead and transferred. And what they notice in the tank, and that's on the far right image, is that there's a lot of micro pitting. So periodically they would have to go and do a polishing and then a passivation on that vessel. And, uh, and that's, that's problematic. It, it takes time, it adds cost to it. Uh, so we want to be thinking about at what frequency to use an acid to maintain that surface. Uh, this buffer is quite easy to rinse off um, or to clean with a low concentration detergent, short cleaning time, um, but that's more, but maintenance of the surface is, is a question mark. Uh, so you can look at uh, developing a predictive model. Uh, in this case, uh, we wanted to do three things. One is evaluate the cleaning procedure. Second, evaluated the passive layer uh, during a wet storage of the buffer. And third is implementation of a low concentration acid cleaner to maintain the surface. Uh, so the, the first thing was just to confirm that uh, the cleaning procedure with a low concentration alkaline detergent uh, was effective at, at cleaning the buffer. Secondly, we wanted to evaluate uh, that passive layer as a function of storage. So we took a 316L stainless steel coupon, exposed it to 10% of a formulated citric acid detergent, at 70 degrees for 60 minutes um, and confirmed that that was passive. Then we exposed it to the buffer and the buffer and then periodically tested that and we showed failure between seven to 14 days. Uh, the next step is to evaluate, next slide please. The next step is to evaluate a low concentration acid treatment to try to maintain it. Um, so in this case, we know that between seven to 14 days, we see a failure. Um, and, and now we're going to um, go ahead and expose it to uh, an acid detergent, in this case, 0.5 and 2% uh, 
at 45 degrees for 10 minute contact time. And um, what we see here is that we don't see an improvement in uh, the passive blare as a function of that acid treatment. However, Richard, you want to go to that? Can you see the screen? No, I can't. Ooh. Do you want to make me the? Yeah, yeah, Paul, uh, I, I'll make you yeah. the presenter. Yeah, OK. OK. Yeah, this control is with you now, Paul. OK, let's go ahead and. Um... Okay. Okay, so the next thing is to increase the temperature. So here we've gone up to 60 degrees and uh, with either a 0.5 or 2% uh, concentration and uh, for 10 minutes. And what we notice is that we extended uh, the, um, the duration. Now we have at 14 days, we see uh, passing results. At 21 days, we see uh, a failure. As we increase it up to a 2%, again at 60 degrees uh, 10 minutes, uh, we see that we have maintained the passive corrosion resistant surface uh, out to uh, 35 days. Another example here is um, uh, in this case, this is a blood fractionation facility, a whole list of buffers. Uh, they, they saw some failures in a rupture disc um, due to the corrosive nature of the solutions. Um, evaluate the cleaning, uh, in this case using deionized water, and then evaluate the passive layer during a wet storage of the buffer. And then we wanted to uh, utilize a low concentration of an acid to maintain the surface. Uh, so the first round of testing uh, confirmed that deionized water can rinse off all these buffers. Uh, the second thing was to evaluate that passive layer as a function of the wet storage. And we noticed that the pH 5 acetate and the one normal sodium, hydro sodium chloride with one molar um, acetic acid resulted in some failure of the passive layer. Um, so, and we saw that between uh, 72 to 96 hours. Uh, so the next step would be to go ahead and implement um, a low concentration acid rinse, in this case, every three to four days uh, at 0.5%, 80 degrees uh, for 10 minutes, um, and try to maintain it past that, um, in this case, that 96 hours. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at extending it out um, past 31 days, with just doing an acid rinse every three to four days, and it maintains that uh, that passive, that corrosion resistant surface. Uh, the next area um, to discuss is in regards to direct contact surfaces. Um, here, we want to be thinking about preventive approaches as well as uh, routine approaches. This is an area of highest risk. Uh, this would be bioreactors, centrifuges, uh, uh, chromatography skids, filtration skids, uh, uh, product storage tanks, um, high risk applications. We want to maintain that stainless steel surface uh, to effectively clean and effectively control microbes of that surface. And we do actually, um, the best approach is a routine use of an acid as part of your cleaning procedure to maintain that stainless steel. However, we've seen the industry take a look at that and say, do I really need that as part of the cleaning procedures? One of the things that um, I know my lab does is a lot of cleaning evaluations on coupons. We utilize 304 stainless steel quite frequently for these cleaning studies 
and um, a lot of some, occasionally we will see micro pitting on the 304 as seen on the images on your left um, and the the quality of the stainless steel can obviously play a, a role in that so we have passivated 304 non-passivated passivated, passivated um, 316 and uh, 316L low carbon and we can see a difference in that. So we want to be watching for this as a function of our cleaning studies and that's going to drive decisions to go with routine acid use or um, really pursue a preventive maintenance strategy for those surfaces. And another example here is in a, a harvest media here in which case on our image on our far left is a non-passivated 304 coupon. It was exposed to uh, the culture soil for 96 hours and then um, and we see clear micro pitting um, on, those, on the surface or corrosion spots on the surface. If we take the next image as a non-passivated 316L, we're still seeing some dotting on the surface and if we go ahead and clean that, we may not remove that with an alkaline detergent. We would have to probably look at an acid detergent to remove it. Now, the two images on your far left is a passivated 316L coupon and a clean and passivated coupon. So here, we know that this soil is going to be aggressive on that surface. So we want to maintain that passive state of the 316L surface and it will require typically a routine acid rinse as part of your cleaning procedure. Now we've also seen this used in, uh, in different applications. So this is a continuous flow centrifuge referred to as a disc stack centrifuge. And we're seeing discolorations of the discs. Um, in this case, this is a duplex material, uh, but this is a corrosion product onto the, on the um, on the metal surface. And we can evaluate the cleaning. In this case, it's using a 6% alkaline detergent with an oxidative chemistry, 65 degrees for three hours, um, with a flow rate of 110 uh, liters per minute. Um, and we're not, we're only seeing the discoloration on the duplex and not on the stainless steel surface. We can evaluate a lab model and go through a series of soiling and cleaning and see at what point do we see some discoloration. Uh, so in this case, we saw discoloration after 14 exposures and cleaning uh, evaluations. Um, we can then incorporate an acid detergent uh, wash after the alkaline detergent and then evaluate to see if there's an improvement. Uh, so in this case, incorporating a four and a half percent um, acid detergent at 65 degrees for 30 minutes following the cleaning procedure can maintain that duplex material well out after 14 uh, cycles. So you can implement, you know, acid detergent steps as part of your routine cleaning and you can lo also look at implementing them as part of preventive maintenance using laboratory models to develop that frequency as well as those parameters like concentration, temperature, and time. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is um, the use of um, some ad, ad other benefits of incorporating an acid, uh, especially for routine use. Uh, we see that it's, it's quite effective at removing trace um, inorganic residues uh, from water, steam, raw materials. Um, we also see that they assist with bio burn reduction. And a lot of times, something like a 1%, 60 degrees for 10 minutes, you can see sanitization effect, you can observe some endotoxin reduction, and you can actually even um, observe uh, virus reduction off surfaces. And some of that information is, is, is published. Okay, so at this time, let me do a, a quick little wrap up. And uh, so we covered uh, some background information. We also covered, and Uday, I'm not able to see my 
screen right now. Okay. Uh, no, you are still the presenter, Paul. Okay. Okay, so we'll. You want to take the questions now? Uh, yep. Actually, we can take okay. questions now. Yeah. Okay. So here's the first question. Uh, what What is the recommended roughness RA value for contact parts which are made up of three one six L and non contact parts which are made up of three zero four L SS? Richard, do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I think um, the uh, you can check the uh, specs in the uh, ASME, the uh, one of the guidelines. Um, so I can't remember the uh, value on top of my head. This I think it's around fifteen to twenty-five. Yeah, around there. So Paul, can you just uh, yeah, add in? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, uh, sometimes we do see electro polish surfaces um, very um, almost mirror like finishes for production equipment um, in some cases uh, the 304 I typically see those same type of of uh, specifications for that um, there you're looking more at the metallurgy um, than necessarily the the roughness okay so here's the second question uh, is there any procedure available to ensure proper passivation? Uh, you know, means the end point of passivation. Uh, is there any, you know, so you know that the passivation which you have done is correct, it's proper. So, um, so yes, there is um, the American Standard Biopharmaceutical uh, uh, Manufacturing Engineers recommends a couple of techniques that can be used to to monitor the passive layer formation and also uh, recommend some conditions in terms of temperature, times, and concentrations of select acids that can be used, uh, such as citric acid, nitric acid, phosphoric acid uh, based products. Uh, so those are some good references and also to reach out to the vendors that provide acid products uh, like Steris, they can give you some recommendations in terms of products, temperature, times, concentrations uh, to achieve a passive surface. Thank you. How rouge can affect water quality? Uh, yeah, and I think Richard covered some of this. Um, you would see um, rouge is going to potentially move iron through your system that free iron from the surface that can then uh, lead to type 1 rouge elsewhere in your system. Um, iron is measured indirectly through some conductivity unless you have iron mon monitoring um, as I talked about in terms of inline monitoring. Um, but you may see some um, changes in TOC counts uh, total organic carbon counts. Um, as Richard talked about, um, rouge can increase the level of microbe attachment to the surface. So you could see increases in TOC, you could in see increases uh, in microbes and colony forming units, and you could see increases in endotoxins if they're gram negative organisms growing in the system. Uh, so the rouge changes the surface properties so that you can have more organic material as well as microbes attached to that surface leading to issues. Thank you. Uh, many times uh, people use nitric acid, 2% nitric acid for passivation. Is this correct? So nitric acid is commonly used for, for passivation. 2% uh, appears to be quite low. Um, but uh, but again, nitric acid is generally a recognized uh, um, acid for passivation. Um, we do see a lot of companies moving away from nitric because of safety concerns and looking at phosphoric or citric as a substitute for nitric acid. Uh, thank you. Uh, what should be the frequency for stream sterilizer uh, for the maintenance and uh, passivation where rouging is seen normally within a short time. Yeah, um, I'll take this, Richard. <laughs> um, 
uh, typically you want to be looking at a, a routine cleaning procedure for steam sterilizers um, and that would consist of um, a, a general cleaner typically an alkaline cleaner followed by an acid cleaner and that would be under routine cleaning and that can help out in terms of maintaining it and then you want to you know assess it uh, I would say every uh, six months to a year to see if a more aggressive cleaning and possibly even a passivation is needed. Uh, but typically I see um, some type of light cleaning for autoclaves on a, on a frequent basis, and I'm talking about weekly, and then you would then do an assessment for a periodic uh, maintenance, which would include uh, um, a passivation type treatment. Thank you. Uh, any method to remove type 3 rouge? Yeah, I think uh, for type 3 rouge, it's basically um, can't be uh, fully removed by the chemical means. So once you have a type 3 rouge, typically you will need either electro polish or mechanical polish, basically to restore to the original shiny surface. Yeah, and sometimes it's the, the main thing with type 3 is to remove any loose particles from the surface that would be moving um, through the system. Uh, so sometimes we see an acid treatment to remove that loosely attached material and you would still have a shiny black surface, a magnetite layer underneath. Um, sometimes that's referred, that can be a protective layer. Uh, so depend upon where that type 3 is, whether or not you're going to do a full removal with electropolishing or mechanical polishing, or you're going to do um, uh, an acid treatment just to remove the loose particulates. Okay, there are several questions, but I, I don't think, uh, you know, there are almost 25 to 30 questions. We will not be able to take all of it. So I'll just take the last one and then we'll go to the presentation by Jim. Uh, so this question is, can EDTA help remove iron oxide? So EDTA is a keelant, so it will bind iron um, uh, and so therefore it can, it's generally, um, I see that, hmm. so I haven't really seen that as an effective derouging chemistry. Um, however, like I said, um, EDTA will bind iron. Um, and so generally it's added to formulations to help reduce the impact of iron, calcium, magnesium from interacting with surfactants and other cleaning performance. But I would not necessarily go in with just EDTA as a way to remove rouge. Thank you. I think with this we'll stop the Q&A because we need to move on to the next presentation. So Richard, uh, you can, uh, Jim has already joined. I will make Jim the presenter and you can introduce him. Okay, so next topic will be uh, on the risk-based contamination uh, control strategy. So um, let me introduce Jim. So Mr. Porodin uh, is a Senior Technical Service Manager at Steris Corporation. He has been with Steris Corporation for 20 years. His current technical focus is microbial control in clean rooms and other critical environments. So Mr. Porodin is uh, 2019 a PDA Michael Kosinski Award recipient. So he has a lecture in North America, Europe, Middle East, Asia, and Latin America on issues related to cleaning and disinfection, and also microbial control in clean rooms, validation of disinfectants as well. So Mr. Pori is a frequent industry speaker, and published several PDA book chapters and articles related to cleaning and disinfection and contamination control. So he is uh, active on the PDS COVID-19 task force and the PDS microbial excursions task force. He was also a co-author on PDS technical report 70 on cleaning and disinfection. Uh, Mr. Porin teaches industry regulators as well as the pharmaceutical, biotech and medical device industries at the PDA and the University of Tennessee. So Mr. Porin currently teaches the cleaning and disinfection course as part of the PDA aseptic processing course and at the University of Tennessee parental medications course. So Mr. Porin is current president for the PDA Missouri Valley chapter 
and technical coordinator for the IEST. So Mr. Porin graduated from the University of Illinois with a Master of Arts in Biology. So he previously worked as a clinical research coordinator with the Department of Veterans Affairs in St. Louis, and also as a biology and microbiology instructor at the University of Illinois. So his main hobby is storm chasing and is very active in tornado research and tornado safety. So over to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Richard. Really appreciate that uh, intro. Uh, and before I start here, I just want to mention to you that I recently did a podcast uh, for the Parenteral Drug Association. So wherever you get your podcast, whether it's Spotfly or Apple, if you go out and look for PDA or Parenteral Drug Association uh, podcast, you will see the podcast and can listen to it that I did with the uh, great Tony Kendall in the industry. And the focus of the podcast is the pandemic response and cleaning and disinfection related to the pandemic response. So uh, it's a very interesting podcast. We cover everything from HEPA filters to um, the latest and in, in, in information out there on the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. So uh, be happy if you would be interested in and taking a listen to it. I believe it's free wherever you get your podcast. So uh, I am here this morning. It's been a pleasure to uh, do some work with the ISPE India chapter. Uh, and I'm gonna be speaking on a risk-based contamination control strategy. So let me go ahead and move along. So first let's talk a little bit about the bio burden that we see in clean rooms and where it comes from and give some case studies and examples of that. So we know that the bio burden actually comes from many different sources in your clean room operation. It comes from the aging facilities, things like the ductwork, the uh, sealant on the floor and waxes on the floor as the flooring ages, uh, you start to get more issues with contamination from that. Uh, another big source is the materials and anything that you're bringing into the clean room. In fact, raw materials uh, oftentimes are looked at as potential sources of contamination. Of course, operators, personnel in clean rooms, that accounts for about 80% of the bio burden in the room. Uh, and that's because we shed millions of particles and millions of skin flakes a day. And on those surface uh, surfaces uh, in the clean room uh, can land uh, potentially viable microorganisms from the operator or person in the clean room. And of course, whatever your process is uh, in that uh, clean room facility. So if you're doing something, for example, with IV bags or saline uh, bags, uh, those tend to have a propensity to leak. So on those conveyor belt systems, you get a lot of leaking and it gets sticky and you get pooling. So it may require an additional cleaning step uh, as well. And then of course, when we talk about utilities, contamination can come from the water so I'm sure Paul mentioned biofilm, so uh, that's certainly a source. And of course, compressed gases, helium, argon, nitrogen, and one of the organisms we see that can survive under those adverse conditions is called cutie bacterium acnes. Uh, that's actually an organism that can live on the skin in, uh, in acne and contaminate surfaces in the room, and it can fluctuate between aerobic and anaerobic environments. And then we have uh, equipment. So anytime uh, you place new equipment or existing equipment in a clean room, uh, it can potentially be a source of things like bacillus or mold. Uh, and especially where you place it can affect contamination in a clean room as well. I've seen uh, facilities where if you place the equipment and it's covering an airflow vent where uh, that vent is supposed to be taking the, taking the HEPA filtered air and recirculating it in the room, you have to be very careful of that because you be, could be blocking that airflow pattern. So one of the good articles I like to mention to take a look at out there is from Dr. Tim Sandel. I was on his cleaning and disinfection uh, webinar the other day, uh, and I don't have the 600 plus publications in the industry that he has, but I have around 50 and uh, he's very well known. He did a very nice PDA journal article taking a look at the clean room microflora over a 10 year time span. So from 2000 to 2009. 
and he categorized this into the different classes of clean rooms. So when we take a closer eye at that, what you see here, uh, and this is what I typically see in the clean room facility, is about 90 or 80% of that bio burden is gram positive cocci. So staph, staphylococcus, micrococcus, enterococcus, and it's that bio burden that flakes off from operators on skin flakes. Uh, and he found about 1% was fungi. And I will have to tell you that that really depends on location and season, because when Tim and I presented at a uh, conference in Prague a couple of years ago, we had a regulator there from Japan, and she made a comment that uh, during the summer months, the fungal levels are up to 10 to 15%. And that's actually what I see when I go to places like uh, Singapore or Puerto Rico or Brazil or Argentina, I see those fungal spore levels higher and higher, uh, maybe even up to 15% because it does depend on location. Also, it depends on season, like the springtime. And then we also see gram-positive rods, so bacillus, and that to some degree can depend on location as well. So in the United States and Iowa, where there's a lot of farmland, if you live on that farmland, uh, that can potentially be a source uh, of contamination on shoes. So what Tim did is he actually broke this down in the percentages uh, and in A and B areas and C and D areas, again, that accounts for about 80% of the gram positive cocci. And that's typically what I see in the clean room as well. And bacillus is around 10 to 13%. Corone bacterium, uh, which are gram-positive rods, non-spore forming, around 3 to 5%. And fun fungal spores is around 3%. But again, I will preface that, what it, that it really depends on location and on season. So one of the biggest sources of contamination that I get a lot of calls about and that I get involved with in terms of investigations are these little canidia spores. So the little white hair-like projections you see here on this auger plate with the aspergillus, those are my actual canidia spores. Those can break off, get into the worst case locations in the room and spread in the airflow patterns. This is an example here of a contaminated clean room wall where they were using a high impingement spraying device. The problem was is the spray was so fast and so hard it punched out holes through the wall all the way to the sheetrock. And thus they had a big endemic mold problem, as you can see here, costing a facility about two to $300 million uh, to try and remediate the mold. And this is the problem with the mold spores. So these little uh, canidia spores, you see they have spines on them. So they're called spiny spores. Uh, and if you're doing the uh, European coupon study, the EN 13697, there's a, a 2019 version of that out now. Uh, but these are required to be used in that because these are the mature phase of the spore. So the hardest to kill uh, version of the spore. And as you can see, they can get into my nooks and crannies of my floor and then be very difficult to reach and to decontaminate on the surfaces in the clean room. Uh, this is an example of a biofilm, and if you get a biofilm like this in your piping, uh, in your drain area, for example, it can break off and go to other areas of your system. Uh, these are also notorious for <clears throat> being an issue with the water for injection systems as well. <clears throat> so I've been involved with a number of uh, issues in the industry, and, and one of them recently uh, involved in ATMP, which is a cell and gene therapy facility where they were having an aspergillus outbreak. And both myself and a colleague of mine from uh, Valsorts uh, worked with this customer. Uh, in their Kappa investigation, they were finding very high mold counts all over the clean room uh, in this cell and gene therapy site uh, from aspergillus. So one of the things that they were looking at in terms of root cause were the tacky mats. They had a lot of um, concern that the wetness from rinsing too frequently was building up underneath the tacky mats, thus making a source for the mold. Uh, the mop heads became very dark in color and they were concerned that those microfiber mop heads might as well be a source. And then the cleaning procedure in the BSC hoods was a big concern. They were doing a wax on, wax off method like waxing your car as opposed to unidirectional 
overlapping strokes by about two inches. So improper cleaning techniques. So right now as it stands, we are still looking at the root for the root cause, <clears throat> but all of these different parameters or variables, uh, I think you can say they are looking into further. <clears throat> I was also involved recently with another Aspergillus outbreak. Uh, I did an audit at a site a year ago up in um, the wintertime in Montreal, which I don't recommend going there in the wintertime. It's very, very cold, minus 40 degrees C, uh, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit rather, so very cold. And uh, one of the things is they had a mold outbreak going on. They found it in the parking lot in a mulch pile in a sterility testing suite, and then in a clean room, a uh, sterile clean room where they were actually uh, filling a CT dye in as their product. And um, uh, they want, first thing I mentioned to them is make sure that these are all the stra same strains of mold. So they were sending it out for an ID test. The other big thing that you want to look at is how does the mold get from point A to point B? So one of the things I noted in the investigation was they were taking a cart <clears throat> from the sterility testing suite all the way down to the aseptic production room and wheeling the cart in there with their EM equipment on it. Uh, that would be a big concern because those cart wheels and the cart itself, even the handle on the cart, which is open underneath, can spread the mold into the clean room. So a big concern. Acrimonium is another mold that I've been involved with recently. And uh, this was from a facility on the West Coast. Uh, they had established very unrealistic limits for mold in the clean room. Uh, they had a limit of zero mold, which is simply not realistic. Uh, they were finding, uh, they found a mold spore <clears throat> actually on a ultra filtration skid from this acrimonium, which as you can see here pictured, uh, it spreads very quickly uh, as across an auger plate. So it becomes a problem uh, when it gets in the facility because of the frequent spread that you get from it. So as a proactive science-based approach, I told them that zero mold's really not reasonable. They really need to look at the levels of mold in the environment and look at establishing a potential limit. <clears throat> and then they really need to take a look at that skid had moved around from different rooms in the clean room. And they may wanna take a look at that as well uh, because it, the mold <clears throat> hit that they have on it was from a random EM sample. And it may just have actually come from another ancillary room, not that ISO 8 room. I also recommended that they do a, a genetic ID of that mold to see in fact, if it's the same mold they picked up in their product a couple of years prior. So whenever you get involved in these uh, investigations, one of the key tools that I recommend using, and yesterday I gave a three hour workshop at A3P in France, is I recommend uh, using tools like this Ashikawa diagram, uh, also known as a, a fishbone diagram. So you put your source of contamination at the end of it, and here it was a mold spore, and then you walk through all the different methods uh, that that mold spore may have potentially uh, been derived into the clean room. So man, have the operators had training, uh, behavior-based training uh, in terms of measurement? Did you set your limits for mold too low? Is it zero mold you're trying to get? <clears throat> How are the materials brought into that clean room? Uh, how are they decontaminated? We've done studies and published data in the PDA journal uh, I'm sorry, the PDA uh, book chapters, uh, to show that using a sporicide like a hydrogen peroxide paracetic acid chemistry followed by IPA increases the efficacy, so it's a synergistic effect at killing molds on surfaces. Uh, what method are you do, using for analysis? Is it a rapid micro method? Uh, are you using traditional EM sampling? And then in terms of machine, have you had a power outage, construction event? Um, have you had a shutdown? What could potentially be leading to that contamination of the mold? Another thing is to look at doing the five whys. And the way you would do that is you come up with a problem statement. So our facil facility has been now contaminated with aspergillus. And then you go through, you pivot through all these whys. So for example, 
that ATMP cell and gene therapy facility. I put it into the five Ys here. Uh, they were using the wrong dilutions of disinfectant and sporocyte. They were only using 70% IPA, which is isopropanol, for pass-through decon, no sporocyte. Uh, they were rinsing nearly every single day with potable water. Uh, they had not done tr uh, training recently in cleaning, so as a consequence, when we watch them clean uh, the BSC hoods, you see the wax on, wax off methodology. Uh, and the mop heads, when you took a close eye on those microfiber mop heads, they look very, very black. <clears throat> Cartwheels are a huge source of contamination. They need to be cleaned routinely. You can use sporicidal wipes to clean them. You put the wipes on the floor and then you wheel the, uh, you take the wheel and you roll it across the wipes. And that's a good way to decontaminate those cartwheels that may potentially have spores on them. You can also spray the wheel down with the sporicide. Some wheels may be autoclavable. We even have one clean room, a big clean room facility where they built little troughs in the pass-through and the wheel goes and sits in the trough surrounded 360 degrees by sporicide for 15 to 20 minutes. Spraying down any plastic bags you're coming in with sporicide is a good practice. Uh, and of course, when it comes to molds like Aspergillus, if you do have an excursion uh, and an outbreak going on, like I give some examples here <clears throat> from that high impingement spraying device that I mentioned earlier, uh, maybe a broken pipe in the ceiling of the clean room or shutting down the HVAC system, which happened at the New England uh, compounding pharmacy, which I would never recommend. <clears throat> These can lead to contamination. So in that site where they were using the high impingement sprayer, you'll note here that it did punch out holes through the wall. The sprayer, the velocity of it is way too high. You need to be using bucket systems and mops and wipes for cleaning. And sometimes these uh, doors, one of the big problems with them is sometimes they're made with honeycomb and that material lends itself to mold uh, growth. And sometimes the kick plates, as we show here on the door, when operators kick them in, water can get behind this kick plate and moisture can get behind it. And we've seen facilities where aspergillus and other molds will grow at a very high level behind it. So that door may need to be changed out to a solid stainless steel door. And in fact, even the head of a, a black Sharpie marker, aspergillus can grow in that head. So I'd recommend sterile markers and sterile pins. So one of the key things you can do to help to prevent mold outbreaks or bacillus outbreaks, uh, so these kinds of extreme excursion events, is you can do a triple clean. So I would recommend this after a big outbreak of mold uh, where you could use a disinfectant twice followed by the sporocyte. And I recently published an article with Richard uh, that will appear in American Pharmaceutical Review in January. And in this article, you're gonna see that uh, we show using phenols twice followed by the sporocyte is very, very effective at controlling bio burden in the clean room. Uh, and you can take environmental monitoring data after each phase of that, and you can have that as your in situ field trial validation data. Regulators love to see that. <clears throat> Another option is to do what we call a 9X clean. And it's very similar to doing a triple clean. It's using a sporocyte followed by a phenol twice and you do it three days in a row. So either of those are acceptable. Um, uh, certainly another technology you could utilize is VHP. So you would pre-clean the room with a disinfectant and then come in and use the VHP. So let's talk about some of the regulations quickly and then I'll get into the final part of the uh, presentation. So one of the helpful guidance tools out there is USP United States Pharmacopeia uh, general Chapter 1072, and as you'll note here on this slide, uh, it does talk about contamination coming from many different sources uh, in the clean room. So sources such as uh, the processing water, packaging components, manufacturing environment, and of course your operators. PDA's technical report number 70 uh, discusses the same thing, that this contamination comes from many different areas, 
and the real litmus test to see how effective your cleaning and disinfection program really is, is looking at your environmental trending data over time because it creates a videotape over time of what's actually going on in the clean room and what those bio burden levels really are. Uh, the current draft of Annex 1, which may or may not be finalized by this time next year, uh, has several key points in it. Now here I just wanted to highlight <clears throat> a couple of them. So in relation to prior cleaning, it's really not needed. Uh, and I highlighted it in blue here on the slide. Unless uh, you do a process like tissue banking, where you're doing work, let's say, with cadaver or bone paste or a bone, uh, and it's a very dirty environment. So if that's the case, you may need to use a cleaner first. But typically in clean rooms, the majority of the disinfectants you utilize, phenols and quats, are registered, for example, in US with EPA as one-step cleaner slash disinfectants. So they have surfactants to clean the surface and they also provide moderate level of kill. Uh, in terms of rotation, when you take a close look at version 12 of Annex 1, it does specifically call out here under line 524 that the product, uh, one of your rotational products should be effective against all bacteria and all fungi. And we know there's not gonna be any disinfectants that fit that bill. So we do recommend a sporicide as part of your rotation. In fact, yesterday, Tim Sandel on his cleaning and disinfection webinar said the same thing. And residues do need to be periodically removed. They come from many different sources, not just disinfectants. They come from shoe covers, from operators, from processes. Uh, I mentioned earlier IV bags and bags uh, that have saline in them. Uh, those are all potential sources uh, for residue buildup. So a recent uh, 483 from FDA from late this year, I actually pulled it off the web. And uh, from the FDA chat room, you can see here very closely that regulators are paying very close attention to that wet contact time. And they wanna make sure that the surface is wet long enough, whether you're using a mop or a wipe, to kill the bio burden on that surface. If it's not, and if you're not paying attention to that, uh, you could see a, a 483 uh, from that. Uh, this is a good example here where the aseptic area being cleaned and disinfected uh, that it was not done properly and that the BSC hood was not disinfected. So they will issue a 483 on that. Uh, this is another example here where in the cleaning agents that are used in the clean room uh, are actually being used in the sterile area, which would be grade AB or ISO 5, and they're not sterile. So if you're using non-sterile products in the sterile area, regulators will write that up every time. And again, as I highlighted earlier, one of the biggest concerns from the FDA and other global regulators like the MHRA, uh, you will note, are going to, is going to be mold. So here, they're actually highlighting a moldy cap line on a, a filled product. That's a big no-no, big concern. And then uh, the final example here in terms of uh, regulator citations is a warning letter from FDA. And you'll note uh, that basically the problem here is they don't have enough contact time from their sporicidal agent. So you need to be you need to have data that backs up the contact time that you're using of the sporicide. Uh, and the reason being, you're trying to kill harder to kill organisms in that clean room: fungal spores, bacterial spores. Some of them, like catomium, which is a mold, is extremely hard to kill. So you need to make sure that that surface is wet long enough if you have that kind of organism to kill it. So now I wanna just cover some key elements of your contamination control strategy. Uh, and those elements are related to cleaning and disinfection. So cleaning and disinfection is a very delicate balance that you have to think about between uh, all these parameters here that you see on this balance. So number one is always gonna be efficacy. And the reason I say that, I recently gave a cleaning and disinfection webinar for the Parenteral Drug Association, uh, and I asked a poll question, and 90% of the respondents uh, responded that the key criteria in choosing a new disinfectant or sporicide is always 
efficacy. So that's very important. Uh, you also want to consider substrate compatibility. You don't want to use a product, as Fred Ayers, a colleague of mine from Lilly says, that would destroy your clean ring. That would not be ideal. Uh, make sure that you have good use dilution and open container stability. You may need that uh, data from your manufacturer. I had a call ye uh, yesterday from one of the big companies working on the uh, some of the uh, therapeutics for COVID-19, and they were looking for that kind of data for the regulators. Uh, safety uh, is a big concern, safety of operators, disposal of the product. Uh, rinsability and residues is another concern. And so a recent PDA journal article I wanted to highlight here that takes you through not only how to do disinfectant validation and a global approach for that, but it does list out the key nine criteria in choosing a new disinfectant or sporicide, and I listed them out here. I just want to call your attention that efficacy is still one of the top five criteria, uh, and that will always be the case. Compatibility is another big one. So some of the key properties you're going to be looking at is you need to have a broad spectrum disinfectant, effective against gram positives, gram negatives, certain viruses, certain molds. You also want to make sure you have a sporicide for that bacillus and the mold spores. You want to make sure that you have a uh, IPA product because you're going to be sanitizing gloved hands and sanitizing items you bring into the clean room. Uh, contact time is a very critical thing. The surface needs to be wet for the validated contact time to kill the bio burden in that room. Substrate compatibility is a big thing. Cleanability, <clears throat> the ease of application with these uh, products, and the ease of validation. And whatever manufacturer or supplier you go with, you should be able to get an SDS sheet, a C of A. Uh, you would also want to make sure that, uh, <clears throat> that you can get stability studies from that manufacturer open container, uh, use dilution, and that you can get um, analytical test methods if you need them, rinsability studies, compatibility, toxicity, and you would hope that you could get industry uh, leading expertise as well from folks like me in the industry. So here's some of the most commonly used chemical types uh, that I see out there. So for disinfectants, you have phenols, which have been around since about 1800. Uh, they come from carbolic acid and from creosote. So uh, phenolic disinfectants, you have quaternary ammoniums, you have alcohols, and you have a low concentration of 3% H2O2. In terms of uh, sporicides, there's a whole litany of them. So we have bleach, which is sodium hypochlorite, uh, chlorine dioxide, parasitic acid, hydrogen peroxide blends, uh, ozone, which is big with water systems, and uh, we see it used a lot there in WFI systems. Vaporized hydrogen peroxide, also for room decon, uh, is getting more and more frequent in the industry. So this slide just shows you some of the most uh, commonly used products. As I mentioned, there are sporicidal wipes out there. Uh, there's different disinfectants and sporicides. And this pyramid over on the right <clears throat> shows you the most frequently used product in the clean room, uh, which is actually the alcohol because anything coming into the clean room, including your gloved hands, is typically sprayed down with IPA. Uh, the workhorse of the program, as Thomas Arista says from FDA, is in the middle here. That's your phenols and your quats. And up at the top is my nuclear weapon in my arsenal. It's used the least frequently, but would be most efficacious, and that is the sporicide. And this is a very uh, helpful table that shows the resistance <clears throat> of microorganisms to uh, disinfection and sporicide. So if you look closely at it here, uh, when it comes to bacterial spores, bacterial endospores like bacillus, uh, those are going to be the worst case organisms in the room, and you will need a sporicide uh, to be able to kill them. So sporicide should be able to kill from your bacterial spores all the way down the spectrum. Uh, when it comes to phenolic disinfectants, they will kill from mycobacterium, which is TB, all the way down the spectrum. Uh, quaternary ammoniums can kill some of the fungal spores, and they kill everything else here in the spectrum. 
And then when we look at IPA or ethanol, 70%, uh, they will kill, they can kill TB. The key thing would be the contact time, uh, but they're known to kill some fungal spores, gram negatives, and on down the spectrum. And I want to tell you also, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, so the coronavirus, is a enveloped, large envelope virus. So it is very easy and susceptible to killing it. Uh, it's in the category of HIV-1, herpes, hepatitis, uh, making it extremely easy to kill and decontaminate. Spores are very challenging to kill, especially the bacterial endospore, and the reason they have several layers to them. This outer layer made up of a high concentration of sugars is called the exosporium. And it, it, it with some spores like Bacillus cereus, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, Bacillus fericus can be extremely difficult to penetrate. So you need a sporicide that can act on that spore layer and penetrate through and get into the core of the spore, the spore cell, and to kill it. Uh, that can be, you know, a real challenge. And sometimes in the core of some of these more resistant spores of bacillus, uh, you can have certain proteins uh, that essentially can resist biocidal chemistries coming into them. So you need to make sure you have the right sporocyte at the right contact time to kill the spore. And all of these conditions can dramatically affect performance of disinfectants or sporicides. So for example, temperature. If you're working in a cold room at minus five to five C, that will really slow down the reaction speed into the cell uh, of the disinfectant or sporicide. And you may need, uh, in fact, uh, to have a longer contact time uh, by maybe even four times as long as you would at room temperature. Uh, the same uh, interesting, um, well, an interesting phenomenon occurs if you use hot water. So if you use water that's say 80 degrees C, it can temporarily boost the efficacy of the biocidal product, but then you start to see a rapid decrease because you off gas the active like the phenol or the H2O2. Uh, when it comes to contact time, that's a critical thing. Thomas Arista, a well-known FDA regulator always says, uh, when he goes into facilities, he monitors contact time with a stopwatch. So if your surface dries too quickly, like in an ISO 5 area, you either need to reapply it to get the validated contact time, or you need a, to do additional supplementary coupon studies against the worst case bio burden in that area to show that you're able to kill it. Either of those would be acceptable to the FDA. Uh, surface can also have an effect. So one of the facilities I work with in Belgium, they have old vinyl flooring and then they have a new vinyl floor. Well, that old floor has been really problematic over time because the sealant layer has been broken down. So as a consequence, microorganisms can get trapped in it. Uh, so what has happened is in the past year, they replaced all that old vinyl with new vinyl flooring. And I already spoke about earlier uh, some of these tissue banking facilities uh, that may have more organic matter, thus needing an additional cleaning step. So how often do I clean? Cleaning should be based on certain risk-based criteria. Activity level in the clean room, what type of processing are you doing in the room? Is it aseptic processing? Uh, what does your environmental monitoring data show? Uh, another key thing can be uh, if you're taking this risk-based approach, uh, you may want to look at uh, how often am I doing am I doing production in that room? Is it every day, right? So those are all some of the criteria. Another key thing may be the ISO class. Certainly, an ISO five clean room, I'm going to clean a lot more frequently than an ISO eight or ISO nine. And you should put tables like this in your SOP that shows any auditor or regulator. Uh, how frequently you clean the area. It makes it very easy to discern the cleaning frequency. And you can add more granularity to that table, as you see here, from a SOP from our St. Louis clean room. And you'll note here by looking at this that we denote the cleaning products, the surfaces in the room, the ISO classification on the left-hand side here. And then I, inside each of these squares, we denote the cleaning frequencies. So D is daily, M is monthly, A is annually, W is weekly, and S is semi-annually. 
That way, uh, Thomas Arista from FDA can take a close look at this and very easily figure out your frequency. So you should have a rotational strategy, and what I recommend in the industry is you can either rotate two disinfectants and a sporicide, or one disinfectant and a sporicide. Each of those is perfectly acceptable to the uh, regulators. I would never recommend, though, rotating two uh, of the <clears throat> uh, disinfectants uh, in the sense that i am decided I'm gonna rotate a phenol and a quat without a really good cleaning and rinsing step in between. And the reason being, the ionic charge of the surfactants and the uh, quat and phenol are different. So the phenols have an anionic charge, the quats have a cationic charge, and they can come and bind together, making a black sticky residue that's very hard to remove. So either go with phenols or go with quats. I would not recommend both of them on the same clean room surfaces. And in terms of the age old uh, discussion on resistance, we do know that in the clean room industry, there's never been one peer reviewed article or documented article of resistance to disinfectants and sporicides in the room. Uh, we do know though, that in terms of bacterial populations, that things such as not uh, having an effective cleaning method, doing that you know, wipe on, wipe off method, not very effective. So an effective cleaning method, making sure you've got the right product. Uh, a lot of the compounding pharmacies seem to think that IPA kills everything. It doesn't, right? So you need to have the right product for the right bio burden in the room. We do know we have spores. Some of the mold spores like cotomium are very hard to kill. So I need that spore side. And rinsing frequency. So how often should I rinse? Should I rinse every day? Do I rinse once a month, once a week? Well, it should be based on a couple of key criteria. The aesthetics and appearance of the surface. If my clean room floor is supposed to be white and it's turning black. If it's a safety issue, making the floor sticky, tacky, or slippery. So I was in Vigo, Spain last year. They had never rinsed in 12 years at this pharma account. They were using phenols and bleach. I go walking across the floor and my shoes come off on the floor. They stick to the floor. <clears throat> That's because they never rinse. So it was very sticky and tacky. So rinsing should be done periodically based on visual observation and safety. We recommend 70% IPA or ethanol for stainless steel or glass. Water for injection can be used with a damp mopping method for the floor. You should be using a different mop uh, for the floor and the cove of the floor, which is right above the floor, versus the wall and versus the ceiling. And if you have very excessive residual buildup, you can use a sterile cleaner, followed by an IPA rinse or a WFI rinse. And the new draft version of Annex 1, assuming it does get finalized at this time next year, uh, does talk about the need to remove residuals on surfaces in the clean room. You can do this in many ways. So you can spray on a surface the disinfectant uh, in inaccessible areas where you have hoses or piping that's hard to reach. You can mop on that surface, microfiber, polyester foam mop heads. Uh, you can wipe on the surface. And I'm a big fan of, of mopping and wiping because you get that force and friction on the surface. Uh, you can use VHP, you can use uh, gassing or wet misting, always good recommendation, especially uh, in hard to reach areas. <clears throat> and as it mentions here in Annex 1, uh, the use of vaporized, vaporized uh, hydrogen peroxide can certainly be used in clean rooms and on associated surfaces to help reduce microbial levels. I know in the US we see a lot of it used uh, and I often recommend it when you have a big uh, fungal spore outbreak or a big bacillus outbreak that needs to get contained. <clears throat> so VHP, uh, and we're gonna have a talk on this after I take questions, uh, is a very uh, common method used out there, especially you see it used in uh, RAB systems, glove boxes, and isolators for decon. <clears throat> the way it works is you start off with a stock concentration of 35 uh, to 31%. It is then put into the vapor phase and it kills bio burden in the clean room. In fact, I 
was reading through a study last night on its efficacy against mouse parvo. And then it essentially then breaks down into a green chemistry, which is just water and oxygen. And it is great to use VHP decon in conjunction with that manual cleaning and disinfection. So many times I'll recommend to go in and clean the environment first with the surfactant-based disinfectant. And then if you wanted to bring in VHP for, let's say, a big outbreak, that's perfectly fine. And that is all I have, Uday. Uh, I'd be happy to entertain any questions uh, or comments from the audience here. Yeah, sure. We have questions and uh, let's start with that. Okay. Uh, is any fungal strain acceptable during cleaning validation assessment? If yes, what is the guidance limit and need to, uh, is it uh, needed to identify the microbiological strains for prevention of control? Okay, let me make sure I understood that correctly, Uday. So was the question that uh, any, what is an acceptable level of a fungal strain in process yes. equipment? Yeah, in cleaning validation, correct. In cleaning validation. Okay. First of all, is it acceptable? And if it is acceptable, what are the limits? Okay, so typically, even in cleaning validation, I don't know if Paul is still around, but uh, uh, we typically would not want to see high levels of bio burden on the equipment. Uh, and the reason for that is we knew we know from the New England uh, Compounding Pharmacy, as an example, that when it comes to fungus, uh, some of these fungal spores are actually pathogenic. So we had a big outbreak of uh, pathogenic uh, aspergillus fungus in the U.S. from the New England Compounding Pharmacy that killed uh, somewhere around 80 patients uh, with fungal meningitis. So we would want to make sure that the fungal spores, that you're using a sanitizer or sporicide on that equipment or a cleaner that has claims to be able to kill spores. Uh, because we wouldn't want to get those in, into the pop, human population. Thank you. Uh, is it mandatory to perform disinfectant efficacy study or can, can the certificate issued by the manufacturer be used? Yeah, so that's a good question. The questions on disinfectant, uh, what we call DE testing or disinfectant validation. Uh, and what I've seen is in the industry since about 2001 now, the FDA and other industry regulators are actually looking to see to make sure that you've actually generated that kind of data to support the ongoing usage of the products in your facility. So it would be recommended to do the field trials in your facility as well as the coupon testing. And uh, in some cases, you may want to do a suspension study to lead up to the coupon study. Uh, if you're interested, uh, Uday, you can mention to them, I've got a couple of really good articles on how to uh, conduct the validation of disinfectants. I can share them with you. Sure. Or, or uh, you know, Jim, we, we can have a webinar plan in the future in 2021. Uh, on, uh, on <laughs> Perfect in the time of COVID, too. <laughs> yes, let's let's do that. That's great. That's great. Yeah, and okay. if you decide to go to the route uh, the route of doing podcasts, I love podcasts. Sure, we will do that. Okay, uh, here's the next one. Uh, which disinfectant you would suggest for prevention of Pseudomonas uh, cepacea and different Pseudomonas species? Okay, and that's a complicated question because uh, Pseudomonas a lot of times could be affiliated with biofilms and biofilm formation, especially, for example, in uh, if you have drains and cleaners or if you have sinks. So if it is a biofilm, uh, then I would recommend contacting my colleague Richard or Paul because we typically then would recommend a thorough cleaning step followed by bringing in a sporicidal chemistry like a uh, hydrogen peroxide paracetic acid chemistry. Now, I will say in general in a clean room, if it's just pseudomonas on a surface, <clears throat> which is not that common really, but if you do run into it, it's a gram negative, it's actually fairly easy to kill. So phenols will kill it, quaternary ammoniums will kill it, alcohols will kill it. It's not that hard to decontaminate. Thank you. 
uh, is it necessary to perform sterility test of disinfectant solutions daily after preparation? No, if you look at the current draft of Annex 1, and keep in mind it's not finalized, but they do talk about monitoring the bio burden in, in the product, but it really, uh, it depends how you interpret it, but it really pertains to ISO 5 or grade AB clean rooms. So if you're using a, a disinfectant and an ISO 5 and potentially ISO 6 clean room, uh, and it's in a sterile production area like a BSC hood or an ISO 5 sterility filling suite, uh, then it should be sterile. So then you should either sterile filter the disinfectant uh, there, or you should buy a product with a sterility uh, testing certificate to show that it, you know, has been sterilized and it is sterile. Uh, could you briefly comment on how to determine the contact time? Okay, so how to monitor contact time. <clears throat> so the idea behind that, if I spray or wipe the surface or mop it, typically in an ISO 7 or ISO 8 clean room, uh, based on my extensive industry experience, <clears throat> that surface will remain wet for about 20 to 25 minutes. However, in an ISO 5, grade A, B area, it dries very quickly because you have four to 800 air changes per hour. So there, I either recommend to reapply it to get that wet contact time that you validated or do supplementary coupon studies to show at contact times of let's say five minutes or three minutes that I can kill the worst case file burden in that room. Uh, is there a specific disinfection stroke rotation regime you would suggest for a walk-in cold room? Well, that's actually a very difficult question because cold okay. rooms that has very cold temperatures are very difficult to keep decontaminated. The one organism well, there's actually two organisms that love to lo uh, grow and procreate in them. One are mold spores like Aspergillus and Penicillium. Uh, the other one is Bacillus cereus, which could be serious if you get it, right? So uh, what I think would work in there, you could use a, a quaternary ammonium disinfectant that has additional claims against mold. Um, the, uh, and that could be followed up with a sporicide you could either use bleach at a high concentration or a hydrogen peroxide paracetic acid chemistry. I think that would work great. Uh, you would have to talk to the VHP guys who are on after me. I don't know if their VHP systems work at minus five to five degrees C, but if they do, that's an option as well. Uh, have you seen any facilities use gaseous chlorine dioxide? in the way that you described VHP for facility uh, decontamination? I have, but it's not nearly as common as VHP is. Uh, so I have seen it a couple of times at a couple of large biotech sites uh, that had big outbreaks of bacillus. But again, it's not that common. Where I do see chlorine dioxide much more frequently used is in the lab animal arena. And that is because chlorine dioxide, <coughs> because of its acidity, has a really good efficacy against some of these very small uh, naked non-envelope viruses like mouse parvo, guinea pig parvo, canine parvo. So in those environments, I see uh, chlorine dioxide used. VHP is also used there. Okay, next one is... Okay, let me, let me, because there are many questions which have been repeated, so I'm just avoiding them. Okay. Uh, how can we remove pseudomonas from water system if suddenly it occurs? I don't know if you would like to take that. This yeah, so that work. might be more of a biofilm question. If it's in the water system, then I might be concerned that it's actually a growing biofilm in that water system. Uh, you might have other gram negatives like Burkholderia sapatia in there. Uh, stenotropha monas. So if that is the case uh, for biofilm remediation and WFI systems, for example, uh, you would want to have a very good cleaning step, uh, probably with an alkaline cleaner. Uh, then you would want to have a sanitizing step and then maybe even a, an acidic cleaner. So I would uh, work with my colleagues, uh, Richard or Paul, 
and uh, they would have expertise more on the biofilm uh, front. But that's kind of a, a traditional approach that we used to use for biofilms, but that may be what the problem is there. Uh, uh, Annex 1 requires everything going in grade A sterilized. Uh, do you feel it is feasible, particularly open wraps and closed wraps? Well, so with open wraps and closed wraps, you have to realize that the main chemistry used there is actually VHP. Uh, so when you look at, for example, the Bosch RAB system or the uh, any, any RAB system like that, what you see is it's hardwired in underneath so that the VHP actually goes in there. So the only time you would be coming into there, into the uh, RABs and opening it up and doing any uh, cleaning per se is if you have a spill. And there you would be using a sterile IPA, typically in, a, um, in an aerosol can. Uh, if you had to use a disinfectant or a cleaner or a sporicide, uh, you could potentially do that, but you'd wanna make sure not only that it's sterile, but that you go in with the alcohol step and remove any residuals because residues in a RABS or a LABS or a, whether it's open RABS or closed RABS, any residual in there, would be a big contamination risk. So you may have to make sure that it's there's none in there left. Uh, should disinfectant efficacy be demonstrated for viruses in case of manufacturing of drug products containing ingredients of animal origin? Very interesting question. So I can tell you that some of the cell and gene therapy accounts and some of the vaccine manufacturers now are very interested in efficacy against viruses. But I can tell you that, uh, for example, Uday, the, the complexity of that is virus testing can be expensive. Uh, many of your disinfectant manufacturers do, or don't have the ability to do it. They would have to contract it out. And with uh, respect to the disinfectant or sporicide being effective against viruses, there's a, a big hierarchy within them. So some of the uh, viruses like parvoviruses, poliovirus, some of the bird viruses, they are what we call naked, non-envelope viruses, and they can be extremely hard to kill. Other viruses like coronavirus or HIV-1 or herpes, very easy to kill because they're big envelope viruses. So they have that lipid envelope around them where the sporocyte or disinfectant can attach to the envelope and penetrate it. So when it comes to viruses, there is becoming a bigger need out there for that testing. I know a lot of the viral labs in the US, for example, that do viral testing with the ASTM method or the EN method for Europe on, and typically the hard surface is glass as the coupon surface for the testing, uh, that they are very, very busy right now. And one of the reasons is the coronavirus, you know, testing against it. So it's good business. Okay. Yeah, so Jim, we take the last question now so that after this we can go to the uh, next presentation. There are sure. several, but I'm sure we won't be able to answer them. And at the end, we will give everyone's email ID so they can contact you all directly uh, for all these questions. Sure. Uh, so this question is, is fumigation by formaldehyde prohibited by FDA? Uh, it's not prohibited by FDA, but in the US, uh, the group that works with worker safety, which is OSHA. Uh, they do recognize uh, formaldehyde, for example, as an OSHA registered carcinogen. So both in the US and Europe, you've seen the usage of formaldehyde and aldehydes going down, down and down. And that's because of toxicity concerns to operators, uh, to uh, basically anyone working in that environment. And you have to keep in mind that if you were going to use an aldehyde for fumigation, um, you know, like you're going to burn off glutaraldehyde in a pan and fumigate the environment, uh, that you then need to go back and neutralize those residues uh, from the aldehyde before that room can come back into operation. And the downtime from aldehyde usage is about 12 hours. So in pharma, biotech, and med device, they don't like being down for 12 hours. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And with this, we will go to the next presentation. So, Richard, uh, would you like to introduce uh, the next one? Yes, Richard. Hey, thanks, Sule, and thanks, Jim. So, uh, next, uh, 
topic uh, will be on surface decontamination uh, with EHP, uh, fundamentals and facility integrations. So this topic uh, will be presented by Nicholas Tan and Bruno Ace. So I will give a brief introduction to the speakers. Um, first speaker is uh, Nicholas Tan. Uh, he's armed with a business development experience across pharmaceutical and medical device industries. So Nicholas joined Steris in 2013 and has been a pivotal in driving the growth of Steris businesses in Asia Pacific. So he is the regional manager for Steris Capital Equipment Solutions in Asia and is also an active ISPE member. So for Bruno Ace, uh, Bruno is the VHP Global Technical Lead at Steris. So he currently provides technical and project design support for all different vaporized hydrogen peroxide applications globally. With his career spanning over two decades at Steris, Bruno has been instrumental in VHP products design for GMP pharmaceuticals, BSL and F&B industries. This has resulted in a symbiotic creation of new VHP applications and OEM integrations range from flash sterilization to direct injection concepts for isolators, wraps, and material airlocks, up to embedded VHP decontamination utilities with building management systems, which have now become industry standards worldwide and Steris VHP technology references success. So Bruno also supports various main global professional associations on barrier solutions and surface decontaminations and Steris internally on technical and regulatory watch for VHP. So over to you, Nicholas and Bruno. So Nicholas, I'll make you the presenter. Okay. Uh, sorry, Ude, how much time do we have left? Yeah, you, you can present for you, you can present for about 40 minutes, I mean, so 20 minutes each, and then we have Q&A. Okay. So here you are the presenter. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Yes. Okay, great. So good evening, everyone. Um, I know it's evening time for everybody. Uh, so, uh, and it's uh, Diwali time right now as well. So, uh, namaste. My name is Nicholas, and I'll be presenting today on uh, surface decontamination with PHP to fundamentals uh, before my colleague Bruno will touch on the final details. So this is what I'll be going through today. In the interest of time, I understand that most of you have a lot of uh, interest in, uh, in our technologies. Uh, I'll, I'll be quickly make, keep it uh, brief uh, and simple, right? Uh, but of course, we will have time for Q&A later. So this is the agenda for today. So why decontaminate? A brief history lesson. What is VHP? How does it work? How to recognize it? Detect it. Uh, applications types of VHP solutions, uh, as well as delivery before wrapping up. So why decontaminate, right? Um, I think this is pretty obvious, uh, but nonetheless, it's really to uh, really prevent contamination. That's the main thing and really protect your product and also uh, control the, the amounts of bio burden uh, that's in the facility, right? So history lesson, okay. Uh, this is just a quick quiz. I know some of you have uh, probably eating evening snacks and might thinking might be thinking this looks like Tao, uh, but it's not. Uh, it's actually a scalar form, right? So I, I won't keep you in suspense. But basically, uh, this happened many years ago, and you probably might know what it is. It's called anthrax, right? And this is how it looks like. So how does it work? Basically, the airborne bacterium and you breathe it in, it's fatal. Um, if you do not get uh, the cure in time, it's, it's you know, goodbye very soon. Um, so the point is, it's, uh, it's viewed as a potential bioterrorism threat. And that's why uh, the US uh, actually determined, needed a solution for this. And they needed someone uh, with industry experience with uh, a proven uh, 
safe uh, uh, solution like that. And BHP was actually uh, chosen as the solution for this to contain anthrax. So what is VHP and how does it work? Right? So for us, uh, VHP, uh, that's, uh, before we talk about that, we talk about the liquid version. Right? So for us here, we actually call it Vaprox. Uh, Vaprox is 35% hydrogen peroxide, 65% uh, WFI, water fill injection. All right. Uh, this is how it looks like in the liquid version. Um, and basically, uh, when it vaporizes, becomes a gas, uh, that's when it's called uh, VHP, vaporized hydrogen peroxide. All right. And this is the chemical formula. Okay. And it's uh, basically in the liquid version, we vaporized it uh, and it becomes a, a gas and it's working at uh, uh, this range of temperature between 4 to 80 degrees Celsius. Uh, not anything less, like minus five or, or, or less. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and when it breaks down, it breaks down into uh, non-toxic byproducts, which are water vapor and oxygen gas, right? So there's basically no residues left here, right? So B VHP, I, I think you saw the uh, graph of uh, the table shown by Jim earlier. Uh, so this is the range of microbes that VHP can actually kill uh, from the um, uh, least resistant to the most resistant. And as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, surprisingly, actually, uh, the coronavirus, the current pandemic, is actually one of the easiest to kill. It's actually, it falls within this range of envelope viruses. Um, and of course, the hardest to kill uh, are the bacterial spores. And we actually use uh, Bacillus thermophilus as uh, one of our biological indicators. So VHP is actually a very strong uh, oxidizing agent. And when it breaks down, uh, it breaks down uh, the cells, uh, components itself. And um, it has different stage, uh, hydrogen peroxide, it has very, uh, various phases involved. Uh, but basically it's, like, it's been scientifically proven uh, in its gaseous phase, gaseous phase is the most, um, how do you say, uh, highest level antimicrobial activity. So how do you recognize uh, VHP, right? Uh, it's basically, it's a gas and you're not supposed to see it, but if you can see it, uh, then it's not a vapor, right? Uh, because VHP is actually a true vapor. Uh, for your information, vapor is the gaseous phase of water, right? So basically you can't see water vapor, it's all around, around us. Uh, so VHP, you can't see it actually. So just to illustrate further, this is how it looks like. VHP gas is a dry, uh, you can actually see it. Uh, well, you can actually see that, uh, you can actually see the room very clearly. There's nothing. Uh, and that's how it looks. It should look like. Whereas here, you can see that uh, it's a bit misty. Right? You can see it's wet. Uh, and um, this is the difference between the dry and the wet technology. Right? So uh, for us, we want to make sure that our VHP is really dry and uh, it's not liquid right and, and why and these are the problems so when when um, hydrogen peroxide is wet or in this case there's liquid uh you know there's actually damages to equipment damages to walls and paintings so uh this is the last thing that anyone would want to have especially after doing a fumigation you know, just to realize that the equipment or the facility in walls has been damaged and there's really fundamental differences between the gas and the liquid version of hydroproxide. As a gas, uh, VHP can go anywhere, right? And it has a uniform contact to all surfaces. It can go hard to reach places like crevices. Uh, as a gas, it's, a, it's able to go, um, how you say, remove quickly, and there's no risk of increased condensation. It's uh, uh, compatible with materials. Uh, we have many studies uh, that actually prove that it's highly compatible with many materials as a gas, and it I like that. Um, even with electronics as well. So it's actually safe and all right to leave your computer uh, in the room during decontamination, right? Uh, if you're using the gas, right? Uh, as a gas, it goes everywhere, including the HEPA filters. So you even decon uh, HEPA filters as well. Uh, as mentioned, it's uh, really a green technology. So there's no residue left behind. Um, it's repeatable and predictable, right? This is how the uh, VHP uh, process looks like uh, the entire uh, phase. 
uh, starting from left to right. Uh, there's actually four phases, dehumidification, conditioning, decontamination, and aeration. Right? So I'll go through this quickly. So during the first phase, we want to actually bring down the RH, so let's say for a room, for a room to maybe 50 to 60% RH. And then we start to, the next stage is called conditioning. We start to inject uh, vaprox into the room, right? And you can see the concentration goes up, the dotted line. Uh, at the same time, RH goes up. And that's because vaprox is 35% uh, uh, hydroperoxide and 65% WFI, right? And then after that, we reach the, uh, the third stage, the decontamination stage. Uh, whereby we actually want to achieve the six log kill over an extended period. And we're looking at a range of between 250 to 400 ppm uh, on average, right? Uh, and after that, we want to actually remove VHP from the area, uh, either by two ways, uh, it's called the aeration phase. So we actually exhaust it out to the HUs or use a catholic converter to bring it down to water vapor and oxygen gas. Right. So two key things in this slide is that aeration phase among all the four phases is the longest. And there's a condensation point, uh, which means that uh, uh, how you say, our, our VHP will always remain below um, that condensation of dew point. Uh, that's, to, that's where it stays as a, as a gas in the dry state. Anything beyond that, it's uh, a liquid. And that's the last thing that we want. So VHP is a true gaseous process. It's compatible with a wide range of materials, uh, of course, and uh, with every, te every technology that has its drawbacks, uh, it may actually re require uh, longer aeration times, uh, especially like cellulose, uh, no liquids, it may actually condense uh, the gas. So how do you detect it? All right, we can actually use uh, different indicators. In this case, uh, use chemical indicators like this that will change from purple to uh, yellow in the presence of HP gas. Uh, BIs are the gold standard, and basically we want to actually make sure that uh, after being exposed, it should be incubated at 55 degrees Celsius for uh, a week to ensure there's no growth, right? And we, don't have, we can actually detect it using sensors. Uh, in this case, we actually use dragger sensors. Uh, there's various applications involved for VHP, uh, and uh, it really means to be, uh, the main thing is actually decontamination from surfaces to rooms, HVAC filters, and it's really good for clean sterile working environments like the GMP uh, facilities, for example. And these are the different industries that's been used uh, uh, for VHP, uh, from defense and military, VHP has been used uh, in the US and UK Army. Uh, aviation and space has been used in the decontamination of space shuttles, we work with NASA on that. FMB, we work with uh, um, uh, vendors like the Tetra Pak, they de decontaminate their juice pouches. Uh, research labs, healthcare, like the hospitals, we work them. And of course, the numerous pharmaceuticals and uh, medical devices. Okay, so uh, there's various VHP solutions in the market. So right now, we're just taking a quick overview of that. All right, so there's uh, a product. Uh, these are the product ranges, uh, which VHP could be used for, from isolators, filling lines, rooms, to large areas. And just some pictorial representation. Uh, here you can see like filling lines, isolators, and there's the uh, mobile units being used. Right? And not just mobile units, uh, we also have uh, integrated units, there's fixed units, right? Um, so you can see like there's the smaller one and the bigger ones, right? Um, just I for I, this actually is uh, taken from a stuck in uh, Badodora, right? This is a uh, fixed integrated VHP unit. Okay, so the mobile unit, it's a uh, uh, I'll be going through that right now. It's versatile. You can use it in uh, different places and on different equipment types. You can customize. It's uh, budget friendly. You can actually place it within a target area. Then no need to make any uh, modifications involved. The integrated one, you need some planning, right? You actually need to connect to HVAC uh, dedicated systems. It needs to communicate to your building automation systems. Uh, just like a utility, you can. You know, it'll be it'll be just like a utility, just like steam, water, um, uh, for easily access throughout. And the best thing is actually automated. So um, these are the pluses and minus of both technologies. The mobile version, uh, there's really little planning involved. Uh, it's like I say, it's budget friendly. You can use it quickly and uh, at cost, right? Uh, the minus side is that it's labor intensive. 
right? Um, for example, you need to have someone, an operator to go down and uh, operate the machine. Um, if let's say it's in a clean room, I mean, in, in a, well, in a, in a clean, great, higher grade room, uh, the person needs to count up and go inside there. Uh, if it breaks down, you need the person needs to go up there and actually troubleshoot it. So, um, and you just cannot afford to leave it alone on its own. Uh, there's increased variability involved. Uh, variability in the sense that, for example, VHP is a slow moving gas. So uh, it cannot move um, on its own uh, effectively. It needs uh, moving air to actually spread out through the facility. So in this case, if you're using a mobile unit, you need to have fans, right? Uh, but if you use fans, that could be a, uh, a contrast because usually clean facility, clean great facilities uh, do not want uh, fans, right? Because they will increase the particle count. Um, so we don't actually advise that. Uh, high operating cost as well, um, because it's actually using the, the smaller bottles. Uh, unlike the, uh, the integrated units, actually can use the bigger uh, uh, bottles of uh, vape rolls. Uh, if you are decontaminating a large facility, you probably, and a mobile unit can only decon that much volume, you probably will need multiple units. Right? And where are you going to store the units? So that could be another problem. Uh, and also bio burden, that's what my colleague Jim has mentioned. Uh, bio burden, um, you know, anything that moves, whether it's a, a person, a human, or a machine, could be a source of bio burden. So um, that's the that's the risk that you have to take if you're having a mobile unit. Right? Uh, as for the integrated unit, there's actually very low operating cost. Like I mentioned, using a bulk vapor uh, container, it's fully automated. Uh, you can repeat uh, the decon process. It's uh, it, you can actually use for large volume uh, decon. Uh, our equipment we actually can go up to one thousand cubic meters. Uh, you can decon um, uh, zone after zone, area after area. Uh, there's no setup of fans required because it's really meant to be integrated with your HU and BMS, right? And you can use it anytime you want, right? And uh, it's less labor intensive, as in someone doesn't need to go down and push the machine because this machine will be fixed permanently at the HU. Right. Um, of course, that being said, you need some planning and upfront uh, uh, integration involved. And of course, it's a uh, uh, higher cost as well. Okay, and uh, cleaning, right? Uh, I just know Jim was talking about pre-cleaning, which is important uh, because both cleaning as well as the VHP decontamination go hand in hand. So before uh, VHP decontamination, it's important to actually clean, uh, to actually remove on any surface, uh, well, any contaminated surface. Uh, you don't want to make sure that there's any rubbish left behind, right? Um, and you want to make sure that you actually use the uh, proper, uh, proper agent, in this case, like a phosphorus saga agent. And also, it monitor the effectiveness of the disinfection program as well as the uh, regime that you're using. So, in conclusion, uh, VHP complements the overall cleaning master plan. Uh, and after cleaning up, actually, uh, you actually can use VHP to decontaminate hard to reach places. Uh, bio decontamination using VHP is critical to resolve and prevent contamination issues, right? Uh, and we talk about how you can actually can detect and validate VHP using the different indicators and sensors, which I talk about. Uh, we have different um, industries and different users, uh, like I talk about the defense all the way to the pharmaceutical and medical devices. And lastly, there's uh, many different uh, VHP solutions out there in the market, so that's why it's important to choose. Um, uh, to correct manufacturer and vendor with the proven track record and references that can actually uh, basically meet your needs. Okay, so that's all from uh, mine. Uh, I'll now hand it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Bruno Ace. So, <clears throat> you want me to make Bruno the presenter? Yes, please. I'll do that. Yes. So here, Bruno, the control of the screen is with you and you can share your screen. And you have to start your microphone also, you're on mute. Yeah, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we can see your presentation. Okay. So, hello everybody. Can you see my presentation now? Yes, you can, we can. Okay, so 
Oh, it today as sorry, just a second. You can see it now, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So we will go through the principal bit on hardware, integration, communication, application, and also validation in this uh, 15 minutes. So again, for the, the best method choice in conjunction with, and it makes really a synergy with uh, what my other colleagues uh, uh, just talked about with the formulated chemistry, uh, VHP is really uh, part of, of this synergy. And um, depending on the application, if you have soils, if you have more or less decontamination, if you have uh, difficult uh, surfaces to reach, because at the end of the day, uh, all these are surface decontamination technology. So depending on the application, there will be different solution that we can propose. And definitely with the conjunction of formulated chemistry, it's not only cleaning, but uh, we have uh, the full coverage of the application. Now, in terms of VHP, Nicolas went uh, with the mobile system, and uh, I will talk more today on the integrated system, really more focus on this. And uh, really the frequency, the number, the, the complexity of the application really against the volume makes really the means we will need to do the decontamination. So in order to achieve this for integrated solution, we have uh, two different units. We, one will do for 300 cubic meter plus, and the bigger one will do for 1500 cubic meter plus. And we are integrating always inside the service area likely. Um, we can do, we can be above or near this, the, the, the production zone. And the nice thing of this is that we don't have any need to access the white room to do uh, the maintenance or to do anything on the equipment. So there is a, a limited uh, contamination or cross contamination risk uh, by humans or even equipment. So our equipment just only need electricity and dry air to work, some peroxide, and we have different uh, size of peroxide uh, consumable depending on the application also. Also, we can add uh, some external uh, HMI. So in short, uh, an inst VHP installation, the VHP integrated installation is a VHP, a dryer, and H2 too, and electricity. So, In terms of integration, then this VHP unit can be used uh, really as a utility, and we are we, we are distributing that gas wherever we need it. It can be uh, isolators, room material airlock. It's really becoming a utility for the building. The system can be directly injected if it's a material airlock, if it's a small, a smaller room, but also it can be injected inside the duct system to make, to make it more efficient. And we can have also multiple units because we can only do uh, one validated thing at a time. So if we want to do two things at the same time, then we can also multiply to smaller units instead of having just one big unit. And here this application is having also uh, a feed of uh, an, uh, an automatic change of the bulk during the cycle. And we can do the rooms and also the equipment. So the VHP utility can be uh, hooked to different number of HVAC system, not just one. HVAC system and material airlock, and uh, all the signal will be fed back to the BMS, building management system. In terms of sequencing and redundancy, that we with the equipment. We can have multiple units just if, if one is in a service and uh, for the redundancy and the sequencing, it's like uh, here we can see that uh, uh, we only need the VHP unit to do the gassing when the, the HVAC system do the aeration, a second cycle and a third cycle can be also started. And now all this can be calculated beforehand, before the project, then we can find out how much time we need for the different tasks and really uh, 
uh, size the best for the production. So from there, we, we know how many times, how much uh, immobilization, how much time we, we would uh, need to block the zones or the material airlock uh, or the isolator, whatever. This can be pre-calculated as a worst case scenario. Communication and trustability. Now, the GMP today has a lot for the 21 CFR Part 11 option. So all the GMP application, we have to do it. And this is a standard option in our equipment now. This, this cover all the password, uh, aging, uh, complexity, uh, all the requirements made by the GMP. But also we have the audit trail, the print log, the alarm log, cycle trend log, and all this can be fed to the building management system and environment management system. Since uh, most of the time, so the equipment can store all this data on, in, on itself, but it can be pushed to anywhere in your uh, system, in your building management system as a storage. Now, we have more and more requests on the Active Directory side. So the system is also working with Sematic Logon and is also compliant to that. So in short, when you change a, a password in your building management system, it's automatically updated to all our equipment. And uh, our system are mainly based on the Siemens uh, control. But uh, we understand that uh, there can be uh, other different manufacturers involved. So the system with a specific gateway as a standard can work with any other different manufacturer. So application. This system can be as a utility uh, used to make the corridor decontamination here as an example. So that would be once or twice a year this application, but th there is a material airlock here, and this customer is decontaminating four to six times per day. And it can do very, very big volumes here. We have uh, up to 2,500 cubic meter on the corridor. So every time a specific design for a specific application, really the, 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 the main uh, factors are cycle time, frequency, compatibility and also regulation. So we can work in isolators, we can do the transfer hatch, but every zone separately or commonly. And also here we can see the, how it looks like when we are connecting multiple HVAC system from a service area. And uh, this can make it huge here. We have uh, about uh, 250 uh, meter of pipework to be able to cover the complete uh, building application. So it's a very flexible technology. Here, this is a, a different setup. We have a direct, direct injection setup. We have actually three main uh, different way to uh, adapt our, our technology. This is because we work on new project, but also on existing installation. And with these three different methods, we have been able to match 100% of the market need. So the direct injection setup, we are passing the gas directly to the material airlock, to the, to the zones. But our main uh, application is really the recirculation setup, where the gas will recirculate to the, through the different loop, HEPA filter, noise reducer, and the HVAC system. So the complete system is decontaminated. And as Jim, Jim has mentioned, in many countries, when you have high humidity and high temperature, there's a big uh, quantity of uh, mold uh, growing in those uh, different uh, ducts and uh, HVAC system. So the VHV is really reducing all this. And then, again, direct, uh, directly in the in the service area connected to the docks. Now the single pass dilution is a is a recent, so we, we do it since two three years now only, and this is the we developed this really for BSL uh, an application where the, the the HVAC system cannot recirculate. So here this is a BSL three application. Uh, here this is a polio vaccine production. So the the 
the HVAC cannot recirculate, so we just do a dilution in the HVAC system and without really much uh, change, we have also the six log reduction on the surfaces. Again, as I said before, everything we can calculate upfront, we can, we can find out what kind of uh, airflow, gas flow, and time needed for the decontamination. As a dry technology, this is uh, very easy to uh, forecast and calculate the cycle times. When it's wet, that's a different uh, problem, but steris, we, we are trying to keep the dry form. So here again, dilution, and the, the connection will be just on the main dock. So that's not more than this. Now, quick on validation. Uh, we have a steris, we have a, a number of tools to do the validation. We are using chemical indicators. We will, we will use that uh, with a color gradient change. So the time and co concentration will change the color of the chemical indicators. And here you can see that the number two had more exposure than the number three. So we, we know where the weaknesses of the application can be. This is the starting color here as a purple. And when it's fully changed, it's yellow. It doesn't mean that this one will not get killed. The kill is rated with the biological indicators. And only the biological indicators will validate the process. This is here just to, to make a, a gas distribution method to, 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 to validate or, or challenge the, the, the application. So th this works on small volume, but this works also on larger. Uh, here, this is a, a filling uh, isolator system with multiple uh, enclosure. But and, uh, we are using, in addition to these chemical indicators, also uh, electrochemical sensor where we can measure also the, the gas concentration. This is a, a very nice uh, mean that we are also using uh, with a graph to add to the validation protocol. And uh, this is done with a mapping. So each corner, uh, each process surface, and also the HVAC system. And this is done in small volume, but up to the very large production zone where we have multiple rooms. And uh, we can see, we, we can, with this indicator, check if we have a, a, a more or less distribution, and we can also adjust. Process performance, we are doing uh, a cycle development first, and we will find that we will get a full kill. Let's say here as an example, this is a material airlock. In 18 minutes, we had the full kill. Then we are doing a fractional study. We, we are able to, do, to, to reach, to, to find the decom process limits by reducing the exposure time. And here we can see at 10 minutes, we had a few growers. So the cycle validated here can be 14 minutes, and we have always a discussion with the local QA on how much overkill we want to put on the cycle, which can be from 30% to 100% likely. And again, this is a customer decision. This is a QA decision, how much overkill we want to put on the process. This is mostly used for rapid application like material airlock or small room. This is not so much used for larger room. It's more important than uh, to reduce the time on something you are using multiple times per day than if you are just doing the complete zone, it's maybe once every two weeks or per month, which is not important since it's made overnight likely. So after that, we have the process repeatability phase where we need to have a three cycle in a row. Uh, again, this will be challenged with the BIs, the biological indicators, and uh, we will need to have the worst case load and the worst case condition. Worst case load likely is the most important load uh, a material air airlock would, would have, but if it's a production zone that all the machine must be inside, and worst case condition is likely the lowest temperature. So with the three cycle in a row, we will uh, prove that we have a, a process repeatability. And to use the method used with the BIs, especially the BIs are not such a precise technology. If you have a big room, normally we put two or three BI per um, measured spot. And if it's a small room, we put just one BI, single hang, multiple hang, that's a different strategy. 
Now, when we have growth on a single hand method, we will run another cycle with two three BIs where we are the growth. So that's slightly the, the, the strategy we do on validation. How about the questions? Okay, we will have uh, we'll have questions now. There are several, and let me go through them uh, one by one. Okay. Okay. Here's the first one. Uh, VHP gas system usage and decontamination is feasible only in isolators and closed wraps. What do you no. do in open wraps? Um, for the open wraps, we, we decontaminate the room at the same time. Uh, the, we will use a six log uh, uh, BI uh, validation. So we will do the room and the wraps at the same time. And so long the, the wraps is not open, it can be considered, still considered decontaminated. Okay. Uh... We find that the, the BIs of each company are different and BIs of one company does not give same log reduction with uh, other companies VHP system. How do we justify to regulatory agency this, uh, these differences? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I give you our method. We, we try to stick to the same uh, BI source and same BI manufacturer. Um, uh, we 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 get our BI stairs. We get our BI manufacturer, and we we are having a, a devalue window. So what is important is that you always use the same tool. Uh, yes, the mistake to do is to change BI lot and BI manufacturer in the middle of validation. That that will never work. So. I recommend my recommendation is to uh, just always use the same BI with uh, roughly the same D value, and then you can prove the repeatability of the process. But yes, this is true. Don't change. Don't change. Uh, don't change during the flight. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Just to add. Just to add. Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, I think some 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 companies have a uh, habit of changing. Um, their suppliers. Uh, for us, we, when we make sure that uh, our equipment are actually validated for use together with our indicators, our um, chemical as well as the biological indicators, uh, because it's proven and validated. So the point is that if um, if uh, customers are expecting um, uh, the same result when using different equipment and different uh, indicators, uh, that could be um, that could be an issue. So uh, we would just like to repeat that. Uh, for us, we always uh, recommend and highly recommend that uh, if customers were to use uh, one company's um, uh, BHP equipment, they should stick to their company's uh, biological as well as chemical indicators. Okay. As, so here's as a... I've shown in my presentation, uh, uh, BIs, uh, we, we like to use an overkill strategy. Uh, they are not quarter percent temperature sensor. So the uh, other kind of strategy is a need on the on such method. Okay, thank you. Uh, is it necessary a cleaning validation study to demonstrate H2O2 residues are removed or below the established limit value in product contact equipment, sampling equipment, and parts considered worst case difficult to reach? So basically, is asking is that cleaning validation study required to demonstrate that H2O2 residues are removed? There is no H2O2 residues. At the end of the day, is water vapor and oxygen. So that that's the nice thing of the, the technology compared absolutely. to formaldehyde or any other technology. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, is BHP compatible with galvanized iron ducts used in HVAC? Yes, as you yes. can see, as you could see in my presentation, we are getting in very standard gal uh, galvanized duct. Now, my experience is that many metals do catalyze VHP or H2 to vapor. And even, even my point of view, even stainless steel, which is the base of isolator of most of the items we are decontaminating, 
is, is galvanizing uh, H2O2 and even more than uh, galvanized uh, docks. So that's that's not an issue. We we are we are continuously uh, pushing fresh dioxide during our uh, decontamination process, and this is overcoming this uh, slight uh, catalyzation issue. Uh, what is VHP's boiling and condensing point, and how sensitive is VHP to temperature fluctuations and or cool spots in a room? That's a good question. Um, we we are rating our, our, our system. We can adjust the flow rate and injection rate. So we make a VHP unit is a system which is producing a, a precise flow of a gas at a precise concentration. That precise concentration against the humidity that we call saturation because it's H2O2 plus H2O, then we have a dew point. So depending on the concentration and the temperature, we have a table for the different dew points. So we are working against the dew point with VHP technology. So depending on the concentration, I heard before a question if we can do uh, decontamination at uh, minus five or plus five C. Minus yes. five, I've never done it and I don't think it works. But plus five, we've made it two or three times. It's a very slow process, but it works. At, at plus five C, for example, we cannot go over 50 ppm. At uh, 20 degrees C, starting with a dry air, we can be at 1200 ppm, to give you uh, an example with uh, numbers. So yes, it works. Uh, and we can, can stay dry. Okay. Uh, can VHP be used to, uh, you know, for, for uh, if you have contamination of Pseudomonas aerogenesa or S aureus? Yes. S, uh, sorry, definitely. this is for S aureus. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, which which type of VIs would you suggest to use for validation purposes? I have a very good answer for that. There is BI. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 we propose six log BIs with uh, Bacillus sterothermophilus. So that's our standard. But for sure, we could use a uh, four log. But uh, most of the time, everybody wants to work with six log BIs as a standard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how to test an area to know that you know it is ready for work after uh, uh, VHP uh, fumigation? Uh, is it only the physical parameter like humidity can be considered to say that the uh, you you know that uh, the, uh, this fumigation is completed? How do you know? I didn't understand the beginning. Can you repeat? Sorry. Uh, how to test the area is ready for work after fumigation? Okay. Um. There, there, are two, there are two factors here. First, we do a validation of the process. So we are validating that we are back to one ppm, okay? And anyway, as a second safety, we can measure the concentration either with a portable sensor or an embedded sensor to the system. Yeah, so okay. this is what uh, we covered just now about talking about the use of dragger sensors uh, that actually could uh, detect uh, the residual amounts of VHP level uh, in the room after the de after the decontamination, actually we want to bring it down to one ppm. Uh, that would be the safe um, time when people could actually enter uh, the room after fumigation or decontamination. Okay, so we'll take the last question now, uh, and this is about the log reduction. Uh, what log reduction level should use usually be reached in VHP decontamination uh, process? In which kind of application is it mentioned? Uh, no application. The person has not mentioned, but you could, I mean, give for whatever you know. Okay. Two or three there, there are two. There are two main applications. Let's say so. You have the 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 uh, class A like uh, isolators, wraps, application. Those those are a must at six log. Okay. Now now for the room decon. Um, it can be lower. Uh, many people now aim for the four log reduction. Three log reduction would be also also good, uh, my understanding. Um, 
the only thing is that uh, there are uh, four log BIs on the market standard, but no three log BI standard in the market. So as a rule, uh, a room D count, product, uh, production room D count can be four to six log and an isolator, uh, wraps, anything uh, where you don't have human presence, that, that would be more six log. Okay, I think we'll take one more. There's a special request which has come. Uh, which VHP process is good? A gaseous form or moist form? Uh, nowadays, some companies are promoting mist from uh, H2O2 fogging to have higher uh, efficiency compared to vaporized uh, H2O2. Well, it's it's much easier to do a wet uh, H2O2 form than to keep it dry. As you mentioned before, we need to work against the dew point, etc. The reason we want to keep it dry is for the repeatability. If you are condensing, you never have twice the same condensation. If you have just one C difference, then your process, your process will be different. And in a room, you can have between three to five C difference between the ceiling and the floor. So you, you will see condensation on the floor and not, not on the ceiling. And when, when you have condensation, the gas, there's a chain reaction, the gas goes to, to the condensation. So where if you have, a, let's say, 20C and you, you can stay dry in a material airlock, you can go up to 1,200 ppm. But as soon you you will be wet, it will not be able to go more than 350. So you have 350 on the floor or on the ceiling, but and the floor will be wet. So that's not an equal a good distribution for the for the for the decontamination. And that's why Steris we invented that technology maybe but we want to keep it dry to have the, the most uh, repeatable technology of the market. And it's also the fastest, because if you, if you are dry, then the aeration is quite fast. If you get wet and you need to re-evaporate uh, the, all the liquid on the surface, and when you have re-evaporation, that liquid, uh, we, we talk about the dew point, but it's 65% H2O and 35% H2O2. The, the water will evaporate first where the H2O2 will concentrate on the surface up to 70% and then it's very, very aggressive. So we know many, many people using wet technology having damaged many rooms and surfaces, equipment, where our system can decontaminate even up to computer without any issue. Thank you. Thank okay, you so, for uh, sorry. Go ahead. Add, add next. Sorry, uh, just just one just one more add one more point. Um, so there's many other points that we could we can carry on, but I mean we're gonna stop here. But the point is, uh, if uh, if more people would like to read out more about the uh, the differences between using uh, the gaseous or the the wet uh, versions of hydrogen peroxide, they actually can refer to uh, uh, a previous uh, ISP article. Uh, that we actually have a, a previous ISP article that's published in January, February 2007 uh, in the ISP pharmaceutical engineering article. Uh, the title name is called The Physical Chemistry of uh, Decontamination with Gaseous Hydrogen Peroxide. So uh, yes. that is actually a very good article. Um, if, if any of you are interested, you know, feel free to approach your favorite ISP uh, person in charge. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for excellent presentation and so many questions and answers. So, Richard, can you uh, can you switch on your mic and your uh, uh, video? Thank you so much, Richard, for arranging this excellent conference. People have really appreciated this. You have got several compliments for all the presentations and answering so many questions and answers. And we'll be circulating the recorded version to all all the delegates who have attended and also those who have not attended but who have registered. We had almost, I think, 500 or 600 people who were there during different times for different presentations and I'll send you all the statistics of that. So thank you, thank you, Richard and uh, Nicholas and Bruno and even the earlier presenters who are not here, uh, Paul and Jim, uh, please convey uh, to them. And thank you delegates for attending today's conference. Uh, with this, we'll be uh, closing uh, closing this uh, conference. And Richard, uh, I will give it handed over to you for your concluding remarks. And with your concluding remarks, Richard, we will close this uh, conference. Okay, thank you, Udi. So I hope everyone enjoyed today's sessions, uh, the three topics.
And uh, if you have any further questions, you can always contact us through the email. And I hope everyone uh, uh, have a, a good uh, learning experience and I uh, hope everyone will stay safe and stay healthy. So thank you delegates for attending today. Uh, have a good evening, have a good weekend, and we'll meet next week then. Till that time, stay safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.